Hello, and welcome back to Hemophyte Breakdowns. Today, I'm going to be breaking down the bronze medal match from the Oxford Open 2024. And you're going to recognize, hopefully, both of the fighters here. On the left is going to be Connor Kempal, who you will know is a friend of mine and someone who I used to fight a whole lot over here in the Pennsylvania area. And the other is Mark, who you will remember maybe from Tuesday, who won the gold medal match of the Oxford Open. So, spoiler alert, he's going to win this one too. But I still think it's a worthwhile match to break down because Connor is a very, very good fencer and Mark is as well. But Connor fights in an entirely different manner than the person who Mark beat in the finals, so it'll be interesting to see how he maybe changes up his game and uses some different tactics. Starting off with our first exchange, we see an absolutely beautiful 1-2-3 combination from Connor. 1-2-3 meaning that he throws in a technique that pushes his opponent's blade out of the way, comes right back in along that same line, and strikes his opponent in the head, and then parries the after blow. It's the kind of thing that you normally only see from compound techniques like Shio House, but in this particular case, he was able to execute all three attacks and the two defenses so quickly that he was able to get out clean except that the judges didn't seem to have seen it when it happened. As a result, Mark was a little bit quicker on the jump and threw a follow-up attack left Sverk to Connor's right side, and it does land. However, after this exchange is over, the judges do rectify the fact that uh, Connor was able to throw that attack to parry one after blow and then just got hit by the secondary one and gave him his full three points. But it's worth pointing out that this is going to become a pattern later on in this fight. You see, Mark is clearly a little bit faster at recognizing when the judges don't see something, and as a result of Connor's very small, very tight fencing style, there's going to be a couple times in the future here where he does something pretty fast and pretty incredible, but the judges are going to not really see it and not react to it fast enough before Mark can continue the exchange. For our next exchange, we're going to see something that we might recognize from the gold medal match. Mark comes in with a very strong over-the-top shield how and utilizes the bend of his sword and the fact that he is able to kind of dominate the center line to land a thrust onto Connor's mask. At the exact same time, Connor, who was walking forward in a ox-style position, throws a thrust of his own. And what's worth noting here is that, as I stated in the previous video, one of the strong points of the Shio Hao is its ability to zone out the horizontal position. And you might wonder, well, that might work great against a left plow or a low left position with your point forward. How does it work against a high one? And what we see here is that it works more or less the same. However, there is a noted uh, thing here where Connor, as you watch the slow-mo footage, moved from his high ox guard into a more middle long point guard right as he was trying to thrust. And what that means is that he had to inadvertently lower his hands, lowering his hands, which allowed the shield how from Mark to get in over the top. It's my expectation that if Connor had stayed higher up and done a kind of uh, downward to upward push motion with his thrust from Ox, he might have been able to zone out that Shio Hao, or at the very least turn it into a flat slap to the top of his hands or the top of his head, which would have worked out for him. But in this particular case, because he wound down rather than wound up from his Ox position, he gave Mark the opportunity that he needed and the opening that he needed to bury that thrust. So they both stabbed each other, but it is worth pointing out that the reason he was able to get such a big thrust off was because Connor had moved from his defensive position into a more offensive one. Now our next exchange is a pretty exciting one, but unfortunately it suffers from a pretty poor camera angle here. But at the exact same time, we can still see mostly what happens. Uh, Connor and Mark are fencing back and forth, they throw some attacks that don't really land, and then they get into the grapple where the real good stuff happens. Now, the first thing to point out here is that Connor is left-handed. And what that means is that his hands mirror his opponent's. Now, in a typical right-handed versus right-handed matchup, your offhand sits directly opposite from your opponent's dominant sword hand, and your sword hand does the exact same thing, which means that if you shove your left hand forward, you're probably going to engage meaningfully with their dominant hand and vice versa, which results in a lot of unconsequential tie-ups, where both people control each other's sword and nothing really happens. But with a left-handed person, it's not like that. And what that means is that Connor has to cross his body line with his non-dominant hand in order to grab the dominant hand of Mark. And you see that happen here. At the exact same time as he does this, he pulls his dominant hand, his left hand, up into the air and does a short edge cut downward onto the head and that kind of slips onto the shoulders of Mark. That the judges seem to have missed. 
I'm not 100% sure if the judges actually missed it or not because uh, they move off camera and the judges talk about something that I can't really hear. But the point is, is that after this cut, Connor goes into a disarm position. You'll see it here once again, where after Connor has delivered this cut, he pulls his left arm back and starts engaging with Mark's blade with both his right hand, which is his non-dominant hand, and the grip of his left hand, which is his sword arm. And what you can do with something like that is wrench the sword of your opponent in two different directions. By pushing forward with the hand and pulling back with the grip of your sword, you can sometimes get the blade out of your hand. However, while this is happening, Mark takes his non-dominant hand and shoves it into the face of Connor, which disturbs his mask and his vision and his ability to stand still. So as he's shoving Connor out of the ring, and essentially blinding him, Connor pulls off, gives up his disarm position, and starts trying to stab. And he throws a thrust here, which does look like makes a little bit of contact, but then quickly skips off. And I would be one to agree that that wasn't quite a quality thrust. However, after that, they both push out of the ring and out of the view of the camera. You hear some things happen, and then who cares? But what's important to point out here is that this left versus right grapple situation is a really interesting one that you don't see a lot, and one in which right-handed people tend to do very, very poorly because they're just not used to engaging in this mirrored hand matchup. So kudos to Mark for being able to get himself out of a pretty bad position initially, and I wish the judges had maybe caught that short edge cut, but perhaps they thought it wasn't quite uh, good enough. But either way, it was a really cool exchange and one that anyone can learn from if they want to get into this kind of grapple style matchup with a left-handed person. Next up is a pretty short, simple exchange. Connor walks forward in an ox and then just drops a shot straight down onto the hands of Mark. The reason this works isn't just because Connor is sitting in an ox guard, which is extremely unusual for a lot of people to fence against, but because he knows exactly where his openings are. When you're up in a high guard, one of your openings is your hands. And it's ironic that when you go up into a guard where your hands are a little bit more vulnerable than normal, you also are playing a bit of a mind game in that if you know that, you can play a hand snipey game as well. Because anyone who is going for a hand shot or is looking for a hand shot probably is going to expose their own hands in doing so. So what you see here is that Mark is taking a guard that protects his hands from the kind of thing he would see against a more low guard. And while Connor is up in his high guard, he uses that moment of confusion to just drop a strike right on the top of the hands. Afterwards, he parries the afterblow and gets two clean points. But it's a good explanation and a good demonstration of how knowing how to do very basic things out of unusual guards is a great way to get into the head of your opponent and create and utilize openings that normally people would have a lot of experience guarding. Now, this next one seems pretty simple, but it's actually pretty complex. What we see is Mark coming forward and fainting his shield pal, thinking that he's probably going to get Connor into a defensive mindset or at least get a read on what he's going to do next. In response, after seeing that, faint, uh, that Mark has fainted twice in a row, Connor simply throws his own thrust and lands it pretty deep. However, when we watch the slow-mo, what we'll notice is that almost by accident, Mark's second fainted thrust with the shield hell manages to make contact with Connor's jacket and go into a bent position, basically because Connor accidentally walked into it. And what we see is another demonstration of what I mentioned earlier, which is that the shield how was really, really good at seizing these direct openings because despite the fact that he hadn't put everything into it, he still took the shorter, straighter line, which meant that he was able to land a thrust that he probably didn't even intend on landing just because Connor was walking forward and he had a straighter path to the target. But at the same time, they both did land thrusts. You just maybe would want to call into question whether or not Marks was really of quality because again, one of the features of the flat shield how is that it utilizes the natural bend of the sword to get in over people's guards, and I don't really have a problem with that. However, in this particular instance, it was merely that bend of the sword that kind of got stopped by the jacket, and you would might maybe wonder whether or not it had enough forward momentum to actually meaningfully thrust anybody. If this was a straight blade, it would basically look like a little bit of a touch, but because there's that motion in the flex of the blade, it's going to naturally get caught on its way back up on the jacket and make it seem like it made a little bit more contact than it maybe it really did. However, regardless of what you think of this exchange, it was a double and we move on to the next. 
So for our next exchange, we know coming into this that Mark has been fainting his shield house a lot and we see him do so again here. However, at this time, we see an adaptation from Connor in that he seems to recognize that the shield house is a problem and that instead of coming forward or trying to just thrust it out, he takes a step backwards and takes up a high guard. And what that tells you is that Connor acknowledges that Shiel Hao is a problem and that this is his solution, to simply step back, wait for it to come, and hope that he can parry it and repost off of it. However, Mark makes an adaptation of his own. Knowing that he has now forced Connor into a defensive mindset, he feints a Shiel Hao, comes forward, and instead of going anywhere high, ducks low to his left side and throws a hand shot. Now, normally this can be very effective against someone who you have just put into a defensive posture because they're going to be trying to defend excessively and they might try to actually defend that hand shot rather than just hit you over the top. Unfortunately, that is exactly what Connor realizes and that is exactly what Connor does. He recognizes that, that his opponent is going a little too low, that he has fainted an attack and he's probably going to go for something that's not very high priority. So he just throws that Shido House straight over the top and hits Mark right in the crook of the head or the neck or the shoulder somewhere. However, we get another weirdly late halt call from the judges. After Mark is, at least from what I can tell, pretty cleanly hit, he goes up into a high cron and then throws a left spark out of it, which makes some minimal contact. It's questionable whether or not it was any good, but he manages to get through that spark and another spark before the halt is called. And again, I wonder whether or not this is on purpose from the judges or whether or not they're simply just not seeing some of Connor's really fast attacks. There wasn't really a huge amount of power in the shot that Connor put in over the top, but missing it or missing it and then going back through the exchange and allowing some of Mark's after blows to be counted just doesn't seem like a great experience going on here. For the next exchange, there's not going to be a lot to talk about because it's another double thrust. And it's another double because, once again, Connor seems to not have an appropriate reaction to the threat of Mark's shield hell. Mark came forward, basically telegraphed that he was going to throw the shield hell when he couched his sword up against his shoulder, threw it, and Connor's response was to try to zone him out with a thrust of his own. And again, we see why the Shio Hao is so good at this. However, we also see that in a left versus right-handed situation, it's a lot more likely that you're going to be able to double, even if you throw your right Shio Hao appropriately, because of the angle that a left-handed person can take in on your inside line. So they stab each other in the face. Marx just gets a slightly better bend out of it because his flicking tip is able to kind of bury itself in more fabric. But all in all, a double and nothing really to talk about. For our next exchange, we see another beautiful attack from Connor. Now, this is something I normally only see him do in Sword and Buckler, but it has a lot of relevance to Longsword as well. And that is basically one in which you feint an attack that's high by bringing your sword pretty well down into a low guard and then scooping it back up with a short edge cut straight to the top of the hands. Now, you see this happen a lot in German practitioners as well, only normally what happens is they're in the fool guard, which is the one where you basically just point your sword straight at the ground and keep your edge up. And it's more of a tippy tap thing where they watch you coming forward with either your hands up or in a long point position. They just want to tap you on the knuckles, mostly to make sure that you know that it's possible and it doesn't generally have a lot of power. But with Connor's version, because there's this wind up and this curl and this Molinae almost like motion, you get a lot more power out of it, but the hard part is making sure that your edge is in alignment. And that's what makes this exchange really the most impressive, is that not only was Connor able to throw a long edge cut that was, of course, a feint, not only was he then able to cross his arms and start pulling up his sword with his flat coming forward, but then to pull out of it yet again, put his long edge, now his short edge, up and throw that cut straight to the hands, which you hear hit. It has a good amount of power on it, and while it may have been a little bit tippy because it wasn't able to stop on the hands, that extra power and that extra intent and that Moline is what allows it to not only reach its target, but to reach it with the kind of quality that judges are going to see. So he gets his points, and this time the judges aren't able to, you know, throw it out. Now, our next exchange is a pretty confusing one, and another one where our camera angle is not giving us very much information. However, it's a bizarre one because it's one that happens when two people who are desperately trying to make sure that they fight clean come into a situation where they both faint against each other at the exact same time. What we see is Mark come forward and Connor go for the exact same play that he did in the very first exchange where he taps your blade off of the line and then comes straight down the same line to touch you in the head. 
However, when he does this, because Mark was never really in range, he's able to tap the sword out of the way, but when he comes back down the line, he actually completely misses Mark altogether. Now, Mark is still moving forward at this point, but he realizes that he almost got hit. So he kind of chases Connor's blade for a second, only to realize that actually, no, there's no reason to do that, and starts coming back in with an attack of his own. Now, here's where the camera angle really throws us through a loop, because it looks to me that from the slow-mo, Mark comes within an inch, or maybe makes some contact with Connor's mask here, but it's impossible to tell whether or not he did so with the flat of his blade while attempting to throw another fainted shield how, or if he managed to turn his edge down. If he did manage to turn his edge down, it's still a little bit questionable whether or not it was a good enough hit or it had enough, you know, momentum or distance traveled, but regardless, it does look like there's some contact there. At the exact same time as this attack is coming in from Mark, Connor realizes he's in a bad position and tries to do a nice little crump how windshield wiper parry onto his other side, and again somehow seems to manage to miss the sword. At which point, as he's coming back up from this windshield wiper parry, he puts his blade directly into the arms of Mark, who has only just now realized that he might have actually made contact with his first attack and starts trying to throw some more. So uh, I don't, I really feel bad for the judges on this one because I don't know how I would have scored it. At the very least, the only real great thing that I saw was Connor's hand cut, but at the exact same time, this, this theoretical flat slap to the top of the head might have been what the judges called and might have ended the exchange there. Either way, though, there's another frustrating thing that I want to point out about the particular judging and rule set of this tournament, which is that, and I'm not going to show it here, but after they're done this exchange, the judges both talk to each fighter and ask them what happened. And... I get the why there might be some rule sets with this option in there, but this is exactly the time where you don't want their input at all whatsoever. Because in my mind, this is where we start getting into the realm of gamifying self-calling. Because at the end of the day, both of these people are going to say that they got hit. And they're going to say it because they probably did. But the reality is that that's not what the judges are going to have to figure out here. They have to figure out whether or not the hits that they saw are good enough. And by asking the two fencers what happened, they're going to get some conflicting information. No fencer is going to say, yeah, I felt it, but I don't think it was any good, because that's not something they can really determine. That's supposed to be your job to determine it. So by going and talking to them, he likely got the answer that, yeah, we both got hit, and he likely turned this into a double of some kind, and maybe it shouldn't have been. But the reality is because he went to talk to them, he polluted his own information and he ensured that something that was going to maybe get thrown to the judges and talk about quality just became a conversation about double and after blow timing. We're coming to our penultimate exchange here and we once again have a rather disappointing one because Connor yet again doesn't seem to have a great answer for Mark Shielhow. Mark comes forward, again, more or less telegraphs that he's going to throw a Shielhow and maybe Connor thought it was going to be another feint or maybe not, but he throws his own thrust while walking hard forward, and this time seems to bail out of his own thrust maybe a little bit early and attempt to throw the shield how up with a cron parry. And again, if you know how the shield how works, especially the flat one, the curve of the blade that comes from flicking it down is absolutely perfect for getting around someone's attempted cron parry or really any kind of high parry at all. It's so good at getting around the guard of these horizontal or sorry vertical straight up into the air parries that it almost seems like a really really poor option especially when coupled with forward momentum connor rather than going backwards was moving forwards which means he shortened the amount of time he had to parry by roughly a hundred percent and gave mark the target that he needed hit the upper part of his shoulder by simply pushing the blade into it so it was really just the worst possible response to a shield how, and it's a little disappointing that once again, not only was Connor trying to parry, but rather than simply stab uh, his opponent straight into the chest as he had done before, he now gives Mark three clean points. So we come now to the final exchange, and as I said at the beginning, spoiler alert, Mark is going to win. However, the exchange in which he wins is still an interesting one, and one in which we have to talk about some aspects of the Geisling and distance and timing. So, as you see from the exchange, Connor's walking forward in a measure, and Mark does a pretty smart thing here and just throws a little Geisling at his legs, expecting that Connor's going to accidentally walk into it. And he probably would have, except he misjudged the distance, it looks like, by about an inch. 
Now, Mark also did a smart thing, which is that when you throw a Geisling, you start immediately walking backwards. Because if you throw a Geisling and you stand still, you might increase your chances of hitting your target, but you also drastically increase the chances that you're going to get hit in an afterblow. And given that so far, any afterblow is giving people full points, it would have come out on top for Connor. So not a good game plan. So he throws the Geisling, it misses, and he starts walking backwards, at which point Connor realizes that this is an extremely vulnerable position for a person to be in and charges. But he charges forward with a hand cut. Now, unfortunately, again, thanks to the camera angle, I can't really see for sure whether or not this lands. In terms of audio, it sounds like it hits a decent amount of cross guard. So my understanding and my expectation is that this hand shot was blocked by Mark, at which point he throws a follow-up hand shot of his own, which Connor doesn't seem to quite be able to parry. Uh, mostly, again, I know this because I hear the plastic sound of steel hitting plastic from Mark's hand shot. So I just expect that that's the outcome and why he won the exchange by getting two clean points here. But one thing to point out is that this happens sometimes, especially in final exchanges where people want to get that cheeky little Geisling. And I think it would have been much better for Connor while he was charging forward to recognize that, yes, his opponent is in a very vulnerable position, but he's also in a very defensive position. And as I've said in previous videos, when you know someone's going to be defensive, that's the time to pull out the wacky stuff. This would have been an absolutely perfect opportunity to feint one or even multiple strikes in a row, knowing that as Mark was trying to recover from his missed Geisling, he would have inevitably tried to parry something and throw a thrust to the head, a cut to the leg, a cut to the arm, basically anything. As long as it wasn't at that first intention, you basically had a free pass to charge your way into your perfect distance and throw absolutely whatever you wanted, knowing that basically Mark was going to have to try to parry the first intention, which is a great thing to know going into your perfect distance. However, that's not what happened, and unfortunately, it looks like Mark came away with the victory. Now, going back through this exchange, I mentioned before that one of the factors of this fight, big time, was the judges calling halt at sometimes very late times, and again, sometimes going and talking to each fencer and asking them what happened, only for basically every single time they did that, turning the exchange into a double. And I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to talk down to any tournament organizers or the judges in this particular fight, but what I want to make clear is that if you're writing the rules for your tournament or you're going to a tournament that has rules like this, you have to be aware of this potential situation. You have to be aware that not everybody is going to utilize the fact that the judges are going to talk to you about what happened you know, for the betterment of everybody. They're just going to always say, eh, I found a little hit, but it was on the low priority target. Knowing and guessing that their opponent is going to say, yeah, I got hit, and they're going to say where they really got hit. It's one of the gamey ways that you can get around the concept of uh, basically calling your own shots without looking dishonorable to a crowd of people. And it's an unfortunately very common thing that happens, even if people don't intend to do so. So... Just be aware of that if you're ever going to a tournament like that, and be aware of that if you're organizing any tournament of your own. But if you'd like to see more stuff like this and more footage, feel free to send me some. I'm actually getting an uptick in people when sending me tournaments, which I'm really happy about. So the next couple of videos are also probably going to be tournament events. But if you'd like to see more of that, feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next week.